Welcome to the Husker Army Podcast. With your host, Husker fanatic Brian Knudsen. Former Husker wide receiver Kenny Cheatham. And Husker recruiting guru Matt Sass. All right, everybody, fall in at attention. You are locked in and hosting another episode of the Husker Army podcast brought to you by the Husker Army fan page on Facebook. Check them out, Matthew Malone. Today, everybody, I am one of your hosts, Brian Knutson, of course. With me, as always, former Husker wide receiver, Mr. Kenny Cheatham. KC, how you doing? Doing all right, brother. Waiting to hear my, my guy's take on how the defense has been playing the first two games. Can't wait that's, to hear And that's it. We got two awesome guests today, everybody. Two former black shirts. We got Mr. Bernard Thomas joining us today. And, of course, Mr. Tony Ortiz. Guys, both beasts in your own right. We're going to get to the the black shirts here soon, defense. But Nebraska, I mean, they pulled it out, guys. 38-17. It was a nail-biter all the way, truthfully. Till it just seems like we overpowered them. They, we wore them down. Uh, conditioning may have been a little bit better for this game. Who knows? Maybe it wasn't so good for North Dakota. But bottom line is, a win is a win. And I'll take it however we can get it. What do you think, Kenny? Well, uh, first half was a struggle. It was hard to watch. I'm sure you guys felt the same way if you watched it. Um, going into halftime, I wasn't really sure. I had a feeling if it was North Dakota State, we would have been getting our butts handed to us. But it was North Dakota. Um, hoping they were making some changes at halftime. But it just seemed a little dead to me. And it didn't seem like there was any life on the field or in the building. So that was just my take of it. It was kind of hard to watch. It was a hard watch, actually. Bernard, what would you see, man? So first off, win is not a win. <laughs> I grew up, I mean, with, when I came in with guys like Van and Boss and Pope, I mean, win is not a win. The goal is to dominate. If you're not dominating, um, there's a there's a problem. You know I mean, and and the schools that you should be dominating are those first three games. Those first three games, you got to come out and you got to come out and let everybody know that we've been working harder than harder than the rest the rest of the world, and it just doesn't show. Um, like we, if, if once we set the standard as a win is a win and we squeak by, I mean that that lowers for me that lowers uh, our standard. That's not the standard. And, and that's why we're playing how we're playing and everybody has is having issues. You gotta correct the mindset of, if you're not dominating and you're not, you're not coming through to the best of your ability and you're just squeaking by, it's not good enough. I mean, that's why we have any single digit, uh, single digit loss. I couldn't agree more. I mean, man, I thought saying a win is a win was a good thing. But, man, Bernard, you just made me see a whole other side of it, truthfully. For me as a fan, yeah, a win's a win. But, yeah, I can see it from your side of the standpoint. As a player, no, a win is not a win. You expect to go out and dominate a team like North Dakota start to finish, not have it hang in the balance for three and a half quarters. A win is a win against Oklahoma. A win is a win against Wisconsin against Michigan, that's when a win is a win, when you're playing against somebody who is closer to be equally matched with your program, somebody that has the budget that you have, somebody who has the ability to recruit like you can recruit um, and play at – get guys that can play at a high level. You know, when, when, when you're playing against uh, – I think, I think it was um, – uh, who, matter of fact, Zach, Zach Duvall told me this in the uh, in the locker room one time. If you're playing against somebody who is um, not where you not where you're at, you dominate. I mean, if you're playing against somebody who's lower than you, you dominate. If you're playing against somebody who is equally talented as you, you outwork. Them. You're playing against somebody 
who, uh, and you're the underdog, you find a way to win. You outsmart them. You outwork them. You use every tool that you have. There's always a way to win at the end of the day. How about Tony? You? Tony, what do you think, man? What'd you see? I think you're both right. Uh, I think Bernard is definitely right from a, from a locker room perspective. And I think, Brian, you're right from a fan perspective. But here's the reality. Uh, it's a win is a win, and they're not as good as people think they are, right? So they're as good as the competition they're playing. And so because they're as good as the competition they're playing, a win is a win, right? They're not playing Wisconsin because they're not going to squeak by Wisconsin. They're not playing Oklahoma. They're not going to squeak by in Oklahoma. They're playing North Dakota, which ultimately – was in the fight for about three quarters until they wore down, right? So right. they escaped with a W. I don't think 38-17 or 38-14 was a real score. It was 14-7 for majority of the game, right? Yeah. So they got away with it. So a win is a win against a team that they, for the most part, played at the same level as. So to me, I didn't see a difference between North Dakota and Nebraska. So, yeah, they got away with a W because the teams were equally – they were playing the same kind of ball, in my in my opinion, for what I saw. If if I expect the team to dominate, then I'm with Bernard 100 percent right. And any player that looks at it as a as not, they can't play in our level, so we need to get with the win. But they're playing at the level of their competition. They're not as good as what I would want them to be today. It's the same. What I'm seeing is the same I've seen the last two three years, right? It's just the same level of football, the same brand of football, and it hasn't been the same in a long time. And I don't know when we're going to get out of that, but hopefully. We can get into a better rotation of uh, of ball handling, a better rotation of the of ball movement, a better rotation of tackling. Outside of that, man, it's just going to be the same brand of football we've seen the last few years. And see, that's one of the things for me. A lot of times, people hear us as former players speak, and when we're brutally honest, not a take. I think we're being critical, or we're going back to the old days, or whatever. No, we're being brutally honest from how we're seeing it. We're coming from a side of the players of being in there and knowing what it takes and, and, and going a thousand percent every single time and being taught from the guys in front of you. This is how you do it. This isn't acceptable. Yeah, like like B said, everything he said is 100% correct. Everything Tony said is 100% correct. So when we're seeing this and we say, oh, it's North Dakota, and we see that going into halftime, to us, that's it's, for me, it's almost insulting. But then it, it it humbles me and say, oh, how the mighty has fallen. Is, is this where we're at right now? This is where we're at. So we're Nebraska by name and not Nebraska by game as far as going in there and putting it to people and dominating them. People don't fear us anymore. No. It's the ball. They don't. They don't fear us anymore. Yep. We're a laughing stock. And people laugh at us in the Big Ten because, oh, you're coming here, you're supposed to be doing this and that, and you're not doing it. And it, it, it hurts. I know it hurts me. I'm sure it hurts them. And like I said, especially on the defense end, when they get into that, I'm going <laughs> to let them rip because I can never speak from that aspect of it. But I know they have some feelings on what they want to get off their chest. Yeah. We'll, oh, man, we'll definitely dive into that. Silver lining of it. Uh, offense, not too bad. Put up 437 total yards. Uh, 193 through the air, 244 on the ground. You know, that's what Nebraska is known to usually do when they're rolling. Casey Thompson looked pretty decent, 14 to 21. For, like I said, 193 in the air, two touchdowns, one INT. That one was definitely his fault. Didn't see the linebacker hiding in there. So that one was his fault. So Casey looked decent, spread it around, seven different receivers that he targeted. Uh, of course, you had Palmer, four for 82 yards. Kenny? What did you see out of Mr. Trey Palmer yesterday, especially high point in the ball? Yeah, that was a good catch. I think that changed the momentum of the game. I mean, up until that point, it was nip and tuck. Oh. That, if, if he doesn't make that play, where does the game – what happens in the game? That's right. What's the next call? That, that, was, that was a crucial catch by him, a great catch by him. And, I mean, it offered – it changed momentum. And then we had, of course, Borkacher had, had a drop early on in the game. And, and then we're thinking, oh, boy, here we go again. Why why, is, why are we playing Borkacher? Comes back later in the game, you know, and ends up getting hit for uh, a touchdown pass right over the middle, and nobody's covering him. So kind of made up for that. Borkacher ends up with two for 32 yards. 
and one touchdown, it's not really a bad day for a tight end. Right. Absolutely. That was, you know, they, they set it up perfectly on that drive with the adjustments and the shifts, and then they didn't cover him in time, and then he was wide open, pitch and catch. And Chancellor Brewington getting the five-yard touchdown pass toward the end of the game there, it, you know, sealing it. Uh, finally, the offense looked like they were rolling. Uh, they were wearing down North Dakota, which, you know, like we said, though, should have been done from the get-go. But then you get a, a shining star out of the entire thing in Mr. Anthony Grant. The, the king of the jump cut is what he's being called right now. I mean, he finished off the day with, uh, what the heck was it, 23 carries for 189 yards. And two touchdowns, he averaged over eight yards a carry. And finally, we found a running back, I think, a legit number one guy. And he's one of those that if the offensive line isn't creating something, he can make something. And I think we saw – complete evidence of that yesterday. What do you think, Kenny? Yeah, I think he's – I think he is a clear-cut number one back. Um, he makes plays. I, I like how he runs aggressively. He hits the holes. He does the what I, what we call – I'm sure they'll, they'll say it, the Peter Ward dead leg. Oh. <laughs> and then he makes that cut. Um, it's, it's almost like a violent type cut, but he's effective. He was the bright spot for me yesterday. Um in regards to the offense outside of that catch. You know, that's why I tweeted, thank you, 10. <laughs> he said, Enough said. I mean, yeah. Tony, what would you see out of him, man? Uh, you guys, is that the type of back that you guys dreaded to see going against? Yeah, I, I like the backs. I think they got a lot of talent. I like the receiving core. They got a lot of talent. I think, I think at each position there's a lot of talent, but there's always just one football, so we got to spread the ball as much as we can. Um the, the starting tight end when he comes back, I think will give us uh, an opportunity to, to, to really spread that ball a lot more. I'm in, well, I'm in a fantasy draft too, guys. So you got, oh, you're right good. In my fantasy draft. Who's up? <laughs> Am I up again? This is my last pick. Back of quarterback. Best one. I love this. See, this I behind the guys, scenes. I just let my, my picks go. Uh, quarterback, see the best. love for the Huskers, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. This is my pick. So I, I think I think I didn't like O line play too much. I thought defensive line gave us fits. Um, if we're going to have fits from that, we're not going to do very well against a Big Ten defensive line. Um, I think the backs were solid. Uh, but again, I think it's more garbage time solid than it is in game when I need you solid. Got to see how that goes. And I think the jury's still out on the offense. I think um, interesting enough, though, I was watching a post game conference um, conversation between Frost and, and the media. And he said a couple of things that really stuck out to me. One thing he said that stuck out to me was, uh, a little bit of the decision making um, in the middle to early on in the game that they got to get more on the same page. I mean, I think that's just uh, an opportunity for the coaching staff to learn how to work together, right? It's been a carousel of coaches the last couple of years. So now that they got some new folks in there, they got some high, uh, high character guys or guys that are coming in with a, a little bit of a bravado behind them, right? Mickey being from LSU and the other guy being from Pitt. Yep. So we got some people who know what they're doing. Um, so can we fall under the right leadership there? Are we, do we have, can Scott kind of rally those troops together and can, you know, we make the right calls. I think he made a comment about, we got some really smart guys on the coaching staff where we got to get everybody on the same page and yeah. I'm paraphrasing that a little paraphrasing that a little bit, but my concern with that is, is how are we, if we're not on the same page post conference and he's making that uh, he's making that mention in a conversation, where are we at in the middle of a game when a call is needed? Right. And I'm concerned with that, because if that's the case, then what does that sound like? What does that look like in the heat of the moment in the game where something's really needed? Who's 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 leaning on who to make those calls? And I can kind of see that based on what we see in the middle of really heated drives and, and opportunities that we have, whether it was last week or this week, just opportunities on third down to really take advantage of that. And so I'm concerned with that. Hopefully that gets cleaned up a little bit to give those guys who have an opportunity to get the ball uh, an opportunity to get the ball. Bernard, what do you think, man? A guy like Anthony Grant, uh, you, you, a jump cut like that, isn't that something you dreaded to see as a D lineman? Um, he's a big back. I mean, big backs are, aren't easy to all, always always bring down. Um, you know, somebody like a, a combination of uh, Dan Alexander and Kareem Buckhalter. I mean, he's he's got a. 
He's got he's got what it takes. I mean, we got, we got a lot of good things going for our offense. I mean, we've got receivers that pull them down the ball. We've got a, a really good – we've got a QB. I mean, we just got to tighten up in uh, certain spaces like you talked about as far as the uh, offensive line. But um, as far as the offense, we, we got we got something. I mean, we've got something that could end up being a game changer once they start clicking. Now, we, we all know it, it always takes the offense a little longer to get that continuity going. Um, than it does than it does a defense. Yeah, so I got, there's I, there's a lot of good things. There's a lot of good things on both sides. Yeah, I, I agree there. I mean, I, I think the offense has you know shown what they can do when things are really clicking. I, we saw it in the second half. Uh, as to what you were saying there, Tony, about you know being on the same page as a coaching staff, Kenny, me and you talked about it last night. Uh, we're hearing soundings of, you know, somebody said Coach Frost won't divulge who was calling plays in the first and second half. Come to find out, maybe second half, they were kind of working together as to call plays, or it could have been vice versa. Like I told you, I have mixed feelings about that. I'm not yeah. going to sugarcoat it. Some people on here saying, oh, well, they scored 31 points if, if he was calling play calls and all of that. But, yeah, like I've said, we've seen four years of that. Why do we continuously hire offensive coordinators if he's going to call the plays the entire game? We've seen that. I thought it was Troy Walter's fault the first year. We got rid of him. And Scott was calling the plays. Thought it was the other coach's fault. Got rid of him. And Scott was calling the plays. In his press conference, with the, all the changes they made, he said he was going to relinquish, if I'm correct, calling plays. And that would be hard for him to do. 100% correct. When I said it and I tweeted it, people are in their feelings. Oh, what do you think? No, nah, I'm not the dude for you to be fake. I'm not the dude that's going to sit up there and give you kumbaya. Everything's great. I'm going to call a spade a spade. I'm going to tell the truth. That's confusing. You're in game number two. You either let the man call the plays or you put him in a position where he just makes suggestions and let, it, let you call the plays and let it fall back on you. Now we're in the same situation we've been in since you've been there. You're calling all the plays. This is no knock on him. But it's like a power stroke. Is your ego that big that you can't let the other guy take over? I mean, that's just me. I mean, you, you work together. Coach, I was going to coach all the work together. Hey, Frank, what do you think? You would hear him in the headset. Blah, 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 time. Okay. And they would do it. That's how it's supposed to be. Work together. Yeah. You said it last week, Kenny. Trust your staff. When we were talking about what it takes for Scott to save his job, you said trust your staff. You know, it, defensively, offensively, do you know Coach McBride would get on his coaches and they would get on them guys, but he trusted that they were going to do what they needed to do. He didn't have to go over there and yell at every position. Hey, George, in that headset, you know, hey, Craig, and they were on him. These guys can tell you. But then when he wanted to ream them all, he jumped on them. So. All right, last thing on the offensive side of the ball for the most part, I guess, uh, you, you kind of touched on it there, Kenny, wondering about Scott's ego a little bit. Uh, he pulled another onside kick. Uh, now, at, at the same time, there was a personal foul penalty leading into that, so we were kicking from the 50. Well, so, was that more of a squib kick than it, it was an onside yeah, kick because I, it of was, the position of the field? Yes, it was looking like Frankie was trying to just dead it right at somebody and see if he could get a bounce off of him, but – uh, granted, we you know field position they still start at the thirty five, but it's better than our own forty where the you know Northwestern started when we screwed it up. But he did it was was it a finger to the fans? It, it, it like I don't no, know. I think the situ I think the situation called for it. I think it was a good call. I think you squib kick it so that you can get it. But I could I could see how you could see it that way. But I, yeah. I certainly think it was from a special teams perspective, field position and acquisition. Just so can we get them in, a, in an opportunity where we keep the ball inside the 25 or the 20, and it didn't work out in our favor, but it's certainly something that I, it, that made sense to try. Um, I don't think it was a statistics thing. Well, this time of the game, this kind of this team is this or that. I think it was a shot to see if we can get a field position out of it and just didn't work out too much. What do you think? We're, we're over two on that, aren't we? Yeah. Was it, it, was it smart, though? I mean, you know it had to be in the back of his head that I'm going to try this. If we don't get it, we're going to catch flack for trying this again. Granted, like we said, it looked more like a squid kick rather than an onside. 
but you could hear fans during the TV broadcast after he did that screaming, what are you doing? Yeah. And I don't, and I don't think that, you know, we need to, you know, we need to send approval through the fan base to see if this play is going to work or not. And I, I know it feels like that sometimes, but I don't think we need to escalate anything up the chain to see if it's going to work. I think you play football the way you feel like the game needs to be played. And, and at some point in the game, especially in special teams, like I've always known six to 12 points a game, right? So I think an opportunity for field position was there. We took it. It didn't work out. If the penalty didn't, uh, if the penalty wasn't in play prior to the kick, then probably we wouldn't have seen a script kick, right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think the penalty dictated that more than anything else. So I'm okay with the kick. All right. but, I, Ken, but I get it. Kenny, my eyes are horrible. How are we doing on time, my man? Oh, nothing popped up yet. All right, good deal, good deal. All right, might as well move on, guys. We, we've talked about everything we, I think we could for a silver lining with the offense. Let, let's just jump into it, guys. Defense, it still doesn't look like the black shirts to me. They gave up 306 total yards. That's not really bad. 131 in the air. I can deal with that all day long. 175 on the ground and 63 of that in one chunk play. I'm not okay with that, especially a team like North Dakota. I am not okay with that. Bernard, what, 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 would, what would have been the mentality going into this? Anything over 50 yards on the ground and you're disappointed, right? I just feel like the hunger and tracking the ball and being disciplined is where the work needs to happen. Everybody's waiting for somebody else to make a play. And when you're when you play a so they go back and forth between a three four and a four three. Yep. Your, your four three is completely gap sound. Everybody has a gap. They need they need to know where to go. When they go three four, the purpose of a three four is you have four linebackers and you you should never know where the blitz is coming from. I mean, it's it's not always gap sound when you have uh guys two gapping or you have a four eye you mean you're setting yourself up for having uh those big guys up front to be able to keep those linebackers clean which is also the purpose of that three four so you got to choose do we want to be completely gap sound or do we want to make sure that uh up front that we're going to have guys that can really control the line of scrimmage. I mean, which is basically having uh, a nose and three solid defensive tackles. I mean, and then having that that secondary and linebacker core understand how to how to make a D lineman right uh, when 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 he two gaps and making sure the the back end is coming downhill. Tony, Tony, what do you see, man? Uh, look, the black shirts did – all right, they're not the black shirts just yet this season, man. They're, they're just not. Yeah, I think it's premature to to think that they're playing uh, – that they're going to play week eight, week ten football, week two, right? Yeah. So I think they need a chance to – I think they're more like the offense in the sense that they need a chance to get together and – and blend more because there's a lot more transfer portal guys on the defense this year than have been in the past. Right. And yeah. younger guys kind of stepping up. So I think guys need to get a feel for their positions to get a feel for who they're playing next to. There's a level of trust that's with one another. And I think there's, there's an, there's a gap there in terms of knowledge base in terms of what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. And I think that just comes with time. Um, there's no preseason in college football, so right now they're one and two in the pre or one and one in the preseason, right? Essentially, uh, I know Northwest was more of a, 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 a Big Ten game, but you know with this preseason game, in my opinion, with North Dakota, I think they need one more or two more really to kind of get that defense where it needs to be, at least to be competitive enough for the numbers to look a little better. The garbage numbers, I think, toward the end of the game, with the one sixty-three yard run, sticks out. But essentially, I thought they played fairly well. Um, not good enough, in my opinion, to garner that uh, a black shirt style defense but you know I, i'm a little biased from that over, over 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 watching what i seen the defense do over a period of time i just think they need a little bit more time there's a lot of transfers 
and they're ready to rock and roll. So I just did, give them a little more time to really gel and blend. And they have, well, their, they have their bright tight spots. <laughs> What'd you get? What'd you oh, get? What was was tight end. Best who available. Was, who'd you get? I don't know. Tell me who I got. We got to find out. No, because I'm letting them do it. And, and it's the last couple of rounds in a 17-round oh, draft. So that's okay. <laughs> Noah Font. Noah Font. That's not too bad. All right. Good that's deal. Steve, that's, Steve, that's Steve Warren's kid, right? That's Steve Warren's yeah, yeah. trade. Beautiful. Favorite, right? That's a good yeah. player. All right, you know, silver linings on the defense as far as the game went. Uh, Garrett Nelson, he looked good. Garrett Nelson was all right. Uh, had a strip sack that yeah. Wynn recovered. So, I mean, that was their lone turnover at, at coverage-wise. Quite a few pass deflections, not too bad. But it, to me, it was, it was the running game. It, it just seemed like we're still not getting that pressure. We got We got a couple sacks on the quarterback in the pass game. But not really that many hurries once again. We weren't getting very many tackles for loss. Uh, and then not to mention the drive that North Dakota went on to end the first half. That that was ridiculous. They went, uh, let's see, I have it written down here. I'm not sure where to heck with it. Time of possession, they had over 36 minutes. Yeah, that was ridiculous. You can't you can't have that. That means we weren't getting them off the field. They're not getting exactly. them off the field. And, and for me, being, you know, offensive player and, and these guys are defensive players. I always looked at it like my question for them is levels. First level guys, lineman DN, second level guys, back backers, third level guys, secondary. What are you seeing, Bernard, from I would say, what you would consider in your area, the first level guys, what aren't they doing in your perspective to get enough pressure on the quarterbacks to clog those holes and stop the runs? Can you hear me? You hear me, B? Say that again. <laughs> I was saying from a DN in the trenches perspective, level one. What do you think they're not doing in order to clog those holes up to cause problems with other teams running the football against us? Because Northwestern ran it well against us and North Dakota ran it well against us. Uh one is penetration and two is being stuck on stuck on blocks. I mean, you got to penetrate. You got to play on the other side of the line, and then you got to get up. Then you have to get off blocks. The thing is, Aaron and Ford. That's linebackers that have to fill. I mean, so if they're stuck on blocks, hey. So if you've got five offensive linemen on top of three D linemen, that's four linebackers that are supposed to be free. I mean, somebody's got to be able to make a play. The the whole job of of that scheme is keeping those guys keeping those guys clean. So it's it's not just a, a D line when they're in that three four. It's the whole front seven. I mean, it's the whole it's the whole front seven. And statistically, number wise, we're always told to you know keep a team. Always got to keep a team under 12 points, you know, but the teams like this, I mean, and I've been in the locker room. I, ha I had a situation where I got the, I got, I had Callahan. So I experienced the, the, the complete sinking ship of uh, Nebraska football. And that, so I understand where those guys, those guys are at, but you have to understand the game. So we had, we had, uh, we had the same guys, Bo Pelini, and had the number one defense for eight weeks. Next season, same guys, and we're five and six. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and it's up front and being and understanding what it is that you're supposed to do, and just being gap sound. I mean, they need an identity. I know we're talking about that DN, but we got to get an identity on. Are, are we going to be playing a 3-4? Are we going to play be playing a 4-3? And the craziest thing that I learned is Bo had us in base. Bo kept us in base, and we dominated. Them. Nothing fancy, nothing pretty. Our base defense, Frisco and Boston. One is over, the other is under. 
couple three on the back end, couple four on the back end, every now and then sprinkling some two. But all we're doing is coming downhill. It's it's a complete team game. You know I mean, with people doing their part, and we got to figure out our identity. You know, and I and I don't want to rag on no Huskers, but we got to figure we got to figure that that shit out. Like if we don't, it's it's gonna get rough. Yeah, Tony, same thing, man. Uh, as a defense, you can't allow a team like North Dakota to go on damn near a seven-minute drive to close out the first half and do it with pretty much ease. It, what, Like Kenny said, what do they got to do to fix things like that from happening? Obviously, first and foremost, is get off the field. I think Bernard hit it on the head, right? He, he pretty much covered the point. Anything I say, it's, it's going to sound a, a little redundant, but – I think he's one thing that he's saying that's 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 over and over that I hear that's consistent is we got to go with something that works and we got to stay with it, right? Nebraska defense over the last 20, 25 years has not been overly complicated. It's been a really basic 4 3 defense um, over the celebratory years, right? Over the years that we were better than where we are today. It wasn't overly complicated then either. We may have substituted a nickel. We may have gone to a dime at times, but at, at best, that was it. That was the worst of it. Otherwise, it was just line up and play, yep. right? Super basic, not overcomplicated, a couple zone drops here and there, but we got after it. And that's the difference in playing in something long enough where you feel comfortable to get on and off blocks and just make plays. Who's that dude? We need somebody to be that dude and 11 guys – all together will play as one, right? Everybody recognizing who they are and the cog in that machine, and let that machine just run. If we're, and to Bernard's point, again, not to belabor it, but to go back and forth between the three, four and the four, three, I couldn't agree with it any more than that, but that's been the model for the last 10 years is what can we do better? And the reason why they do it is because if they stay four, three, they run heavy. They don't have a, a better, a good enough secondary to, do, to deal with the pass first offense. If they stay three, four, they can't stop the run. And guys can't get off blocks, guys can't penetrate, guys can't make plays in the open field. So they need to establish who they are, what they're going to be, and just line up and play and deal with whatever comes their way. But they need that over time in order to compete. I don't see any of these top five power five schools flipping defenses every other series to figure it out. I just don't see it. So why is it that we have to do something like that each and every week over the last few years? And this is not Chin Adler, uh, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. This has been consistent. Maybe, maybe prior, maybe, maybe I did not see that with Bo, and, I, and Bo was more of a defensive guy. Pretty sure I didn't see it with him, but it's been after that that I've seen this flip flop back and forth of what can we run now that's going to work. It's almost a different, it's almost a youth football mentality of I'm just going to line up a different defense every week to see how it goes because they run one specific thing really well. So let's let's change our defense to to accommodate and cater to one one little thing. I just don't. I, I didn't grow up like that. I grew up. It, it, that the philosophy was line up and play, everybody do your damn job and go out there and play. And that's it. And I don't, and I know it's not that simple. I get it. I, I could, and I could say that from a high horse. I completely get it. But we it's have that to. Simple, get, Tony. Just get <laughs> yeah, right. It's that simple. That it's simple. not that difficult. Like, don't, don't it's not hard. It, man. Don't, don't back pedal. Don't back. It. Yeah, it's not hard. Here. I don't it's get simple. it. I, it's not that hard. Just, just line up and play, pick yeah. something, go with it, and ride. That, it really is, it really is that simple. So when they line up in three four, those those guards are up to our linebackers too quick. Yeah. I mean, like I just don't think that portion of it we've got it figured out. And then you gotta learn how to get over the top when you're in that when when you're in that three four for those linebackers, those linebackers to fill. All right. But now I'm gonna say this. We have had Lots of academic All-Americans, more than anybody, any other university. Now, my guys know that we sometimes we've not had the smartest people on our team. When <laughs> you put their ass on the football field, Absolutely. You tell them to track that ball. That's it. It's done. Run and tackle. Hey, it ain't. Hey, it ain't. It ain't. It ain't some. It ain't no rocket science out there. <laughs> yeah, run and tackle. Hit, hit, hit ball. <laughs> Hit ball. That's it. <laughs> See ball, hit ball, man. That's all you got to do. Oh, man. You win yeah, all, all of those. You win all of those. 
We know a lot of those guys we can point out. All right, we're getting we're getting down to the last few minutes here. I, I want to end on kind of a positive note, you know, a little silver lining for the fans, I suppose. You guys remember Will Compton, former black shirt for Nebraska. He was in Lincoln uh, over the weekend for Bussin' with the Boys, his podcast he does. And, guys, for a dead crowd, what this man did to get them back in, it was amazing. We saw the birth of Will Compton's alter ego, Willie Trumpet, with the band doing the theme from Narcos. And I'll tell you what, the fans were silent before that started. Once they saw Will Compton up there with a trumpet giving them some Narcos, I hadn't heard the fans be that loud for a little while. So I've got to give props to Will Compton for being in Lincoln, keeping the fans in it. Will, we love you, man. Thank you so much for that. It's important. I'm sorry. It just, he brought the pageantry. It kept the fans interested, kept them going. So I just had to like, give him some props for that. I like that guy, man. Will's guy a blast. That guy's a character. He's something, He's something else, man. Dude, Will's a blast, man. Got to get him on this show sometime. I hope so. Hope yeah, that so. dude's a trip on Twitter, too. He's something else, man. Dude, yeah. All right, gentlemen, we'll go ahead and wind it down. We're down to the last couple minutes. So yeah, a great points all around. Kenny, you had great questions for these guys. Bernard, Tony answered with truthfulness. And that's all we can ask. Truth. I, you, you want the truth. And, and, I, and I know these guys are passionate about defense. And everyone hears about the word black shirt. But they don't understand what it means to these gentlemen when you get a black shirt. I've seen people cry getting a black shirt. Us on offense, were, were we were envious of them getting black shirts because it was an identity for them. Can you imagine going to practice and you're lining up, you're the ones, we're wearing today's week's jerseys, but the color and you're lining up one-on-ones. All of these dudes are in unison in their uniform. Yeah. It, it, it was like, we wanted black Walking shirts. Walking around in that ugly yellow jersey. <laughs> hey, and when you got a guy with the two jerseys on, you was like, "Ooh, he's not a black shirt. He's not a black <laughs> shirt yet." So, I mean, you know, hey, man, we got to hear how the defense is performing from the defensive players, man, because their passion for that is next level, and I can never match. It. So, for them to be brutally honest, man, I appreciate it. All right, we're down to under a minute, so I'll give the outro, guys. You know where to find us: Twitter, Instagram at Husker Army Pod. So for myself, Brian Knudsen, for Mr. Kenny Cheatham, our guest, Bernard Thomas, Tony Ortiz, former Black Shirts, thank you so much, guys. Sure Husker is. Army, you know what to do. At ease, and you are all dismissed.